Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to our congressional luncheon today. Uh, it's our annual congressional luncheon we have with the CEE. And I'd like to give you some announcements first, shortly. We're proud to say that one of our alumni, fortunately this year was won a $250,000 scholarship. Another alumni was on Jeopardy and won over $68,000. Uh, we have the Lieberman Award going to magnificent members of our alumni. Uh, you'll be meeting them later on and introduction of them as well. At this point, I'd like to introduce everybody to Joe Nero, our president. Hello, everyone. I am Joanne, president of the Center for Excellence in Education, located <laughs> in McLean, Virginia. Most of you know that I co-founded this organization 37 years ago with the late Admiral H.G. Rickover, father of the nuclear-powered submarine and civilian uses of nuclear power. The center's mission has remained focused. Perhaps that is one of the reasons for its terrific success, to nurture high school and university scholars to careers of excellence in leadership in science, technology, engineering, and math, and to encourage STEM collaboration in the global community. The center's programs remain unique and creative, and all are available cost-free to invited students and teachers thereby leveling the playing field for our youth to realize their dreams to successfully pursue careers in science and technology. I invite you to review our website and to let you know that at the end of April, we will have a revised new website in place, which we're very excited to present. Learn about our three programs, the Research Science Institute, collaboratively sponsored each summer for six weeks with MIT on its campus, the USA Biology Olympiad for between seven and 10,000 to compete online each year for the finals in the US with 20 students and the selection of the four member team to compete internationally, where Team USA has medaled in every competition since its first participation in 2003. Our teacher enrichment program is vital, robust, and to date in 12 states, to assist students by assisting teachers with pedagogy and methodology to nurture their students to successfully complete careers in STEM. Those students in rural and urban communities. There are so many ways for you to get involved with us. Participating in a program while speaking, introducing us to organizations, speaking to your organization so that we can broaden the, the information out there about us. And of course, any in-kind support and any financial support is certainly appreciated to keep our programs cost-free. It is now my pleasure to have Susan Coe to moderate today's Zoom Congressional Luncheon. Susan is a long-standing trustee of the Center for Excellence in Education and a very active alumnus of the Research Science Institute. She serves on the executive committee of the Harvard College Fund and chairs her Harvard class reunion campaign. Previously, she was a private equity investor with the Carlisle Group, 
and analyzed investments in distressed debt securities with Ziff Brothers. Mrs. Crow is a graduate of Harvard College and the Harvard Business School and resides in the Boston area with her husband and three delightful children. Susan, it is a pleasure to introduce you. Thank you, Mrs. D. I'm delighted to be with you today to celebrate the achievements of alumni of the Center for Excellence in Education. Although we have become well accustomed to Zoom meetings, I'm incredibly hopeful that next year we will be able to gather again on the Hill in person. With the spirit of cooperation among government, pharmaceutical companies, scientists, and many others, Vaccines to combat the COVID-19 virus have been brought to market with unprecedented speed, leveraging decades of research into vaccine technology. This achievement highlights the critical importance of investment in scientific research and inquiry, and in supporting organizations like the Center, whose mission is to nurture scholars to careers of excellence in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. One of these future leaders is our first speaker today. I am very proud to introduce Yunsa Choi, winner of the 2021 Regeneron Talent Search and alumnus of the 2020 Research Science Institute. She is a senior at Phillips Exeter Academy, a boarding school in New Hampshire, though she has been taking online classes from Seoul, Korea during the past year. At RSI, she studied theoretical economics with Professor Scott Commoners at Harvard, where she will be matriculating next year to study mathematics. On a side note, Professor Commoners also happens to be an alumnus of RSI. Yunsa joins us now from Seoul. Thank you for staying up so late to be with us. Yunsa? Yeah, hi, thank you so much for having me today. One of my first memories of RSI was soon after we had gotten in, we were in a call with a bunch of future classmates and there I had expected to talk about how ridiculous it was that I still had curfew in my boarding school life, but despite me preparing about 10 different ways to say this, um, the conversation was definitely not flowing in anywhere near that direction. There were these students talking about how to save the world from COVID, uh, talking about these recent scientific discoveries and even politics or international affairs. I soon realized that the reason for this was not because of these students just being RSI students, but rather it was because there were two adults with their cameras off named Mrs. D and <laughs> my name for Miss Ballestero. And so <laughs> there we were, desperately trying not to get kicked out of the program that we really wanted to hope to go for for the longest time. And um, only an hour into the call, it was revealed that there were actually two alumni from the year before that were posing as these, these adults. As soon as they opened their cameras, they were laughing, make fun of us how awkward we were. And so as you can tell, RSI only got better from there. Um, but knowing that I had this amazing support group of crazy intellectual students and they were also kind and amazing, um, did not make RSI easy as it should be. Uh, in my very first week of RSI, uh, in the mentorship, so the second week of the program, the first week of mentorship, I was matched with a mentor from the MIT Mathematics Department. And he was a first year graduate student without a mentorship experience. And so it was a really hard time for uh, both of us. Um, I was really doubting myself. I really hoped that I could even understand the question that I was given before um, the end of the six, uh, six weeks of the program. And just when I thought that things just couldn't get worse, <laughs> Um, my mentor sent me an email saying that he was quitting his PhD program, he was quitting this mentorship, and so there I was without a mentor, um, um, like two weeks into the program. And that's when my tutor, Dr. Jenny Sandoba, came to save me. <laughs> um, soon after, she arranged a mentorship with me and Professor Commoners, and she sent me an email saying, oh, he's a little worried that you might not get any results by the end of the program but working, having the chance to work with a scholar in his caliber is worth enduring through some of the hardest parts of research. And for me, I did not have anywhere <laughs> worse to go. And of course, I was just so honored to work with the Professor Commoners. And so without hesitation, I accepted the invitation right away. Um, very luckily, I was able to solve that problem that he gave me within the first week. And from there, he really gave me the steering wheel for the project, um, letting me drive the direction of the research in the ways that I wanted to, but in the way 
um, helping me verify all my proofs, providing expert intuitions when I was stuck and guiding me through the appropriate literature. And so, yeah, I was really excited and really happy when it was uh, well received within RSI and then also in the Regeneron SCS program. But again, I also really wholeheartedly believe that, you know, any progress shouldn't be judged by the resulting outcome. But still, nonetheless, I'm really excited to see uh, what more opportunities this can lead to. RSI was the best experience, the best summer ever. And it really dismantled me. Everything, the little things that I thought that I knew about research and science, it really broke me down, but also built me back up again. Um, and so I really want to thank you all for organizing this, um, giving this opportunity to students like me. It really changed my life. And yeah, I really hope this can continue. <laughs> So I just want to thank you all for this opportunity. Um, I want to take this opportunity actually to thank those at the center and staff and uh, especially Maite Ballestero. Um, last year was the first time that, um, that CEE pivoted and was able to offer the full RSI program online, which was an incredible achievement during incredibly trying times. And we are so delighted that there were so many students who were able to benefit from attending the program. Our next CEE scholar is Bryce Wong, an alumnus of the USA Biology Olympiad. Bryce earned a silver medal in 2012 and a bronze medal in 2013. He went on to receive a BS in computer science and molecular biology, as well as a master of engineering in computational biology from MIT. Bryce is currently a medical student at Stanford and hopes to become a pediatric ophthalmologist. In his free time, he loves all things trivia and recently became a two-time champion on the TV show Jeopardy. Bryce joined us from the hospital um, at Stanford. Bryce? Good afternoon. Thanks for the kind introduction. So I'd just like to chat briefly about two things. The first is a testimonial about the importance of the USA Biology Olympiad to my personal journey in medicine. Um, and the other um, should be eminently obvious to, to most of us here, but it's that those, in, uh, us of, uh, those of us in STEM um, are passionate about a variety of subjects, um, uh, many of which are, are outside of simply um, technology or engineering or math. So for the biology Olympiad, that was the first time that I was exposed to, first of all, to cutting edge research, to essentially that, that entire way of thinking and, and mostly to other folks that were really passionate about the same things that I was, who had memorized biochemistry textbooks, who could identify the order of every insect and bird that we passed, folks that were interested in the mathematical modeling of evolution. Um, that's something I simply wasn't exposed to um, in high school uh, where I was. And it was really a life-changing experience to meet other people like that um, in the environment that the Biology Olympiad provided. Um, beyond that experience, um, alumni of the program have been incredibly important in my journey um, at MIT. Um, they introduced me to the lab that I ended up working in. Um, they introduced me to the world of computational biology, um, which, um, again, I'm thankful to other alumni for, for putting me in touch with programs in that field. Um, and even here at Stanford, uh, I've continued to meet fellow students and mentors who have been alumni of both the Biology Olympiad and RSI, who have helped guide my clinical journey, um, provide um, really solid advice and have just been wonderful people to, to talk to. Um, and the other thing I think, as I said, it should be obvious to all of us here, but it's that us, those of us in STEM are really, we're, we're passionate about a variety of subjects. Um, at the Biology Olympiad, I met people that were interested in archery, in composing classical music, um, in sort of dissecting the details of, of the plaza operas, in surfing, in writing science fiction, making crosswords. Um, and I think meeting folks with all those diversity of interest also sparked my own interest in um, kind of learning a little bit about a lot of different fields. Um, and that 
served me well on Jeopardy, but I think more importantly, it served me well. It has served me well in life, where when I'm chatting with patients or, or just you know meeting people, having that ability to know a little bit about uh, people's interests, I think really makes a, a difference in being able to, to connect more profoundly. So. Overall, I'd really just like to thank the Biology Olympiad for providing such an incredible experience. And thank you to everyone at the center that's made this possible for both myself and for all the other students that have been part of these programs. Um, you've touched more lives than you could possibly know. Thank you. Now I'd like to turn the program over to our esteemed honorary board members. Jackie Rosen is a US Senator representing the state of Nevada. Previously, she served in the U.S. House of Representatives during the 115th Congress, where she was rated one of the most bipartisan freshman members and was a member of the Problem Solvers Caucus. Rosen serves on numerous Senate committees, including Health, Education, Labor and Pensions, Commerce, Science and Transportation, Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs, Small Business and Entrepreneurship, and Armed Services. She has been a champion for encouraging early childhood education in STEM, especially for young girls. Prior to running for elected office, Rosen started her career as a computer programmer and software developer. Unfortunately, Senator Rosen is unable to be with us today, but has graciously prepared these pre recorded remarks. Hi, I'm Senator Jackie Rosen and I'm proud to represent the great state of Nevada in the United States Senate. I want to thank the Center for Excellence in Education for all its work to promote education in our state and for giving me this opportunity to speak on this important subject. The work your organization does every day to nurture careers in science, technology, engineering, and math is critical in creating the next generation of American scientists, engineers, inventors, innovators, and leaders. Across the country, we're continuing to see a huge demand for workers in STEM fields. But despite these increasing opportunities, not enough Americans have access to the right STEM education and training. It's organizations like CEE that are rising to the challenge by providing thousands of underserved students with access to that education. You're helping us close the skills gap and build a workforce that will drive innovation for generations to come. You know, before I came to Congress, I was a computer programmer. I worked in what's long been considered a male dominated industry and it wasn't easy. Like millions of women today, I witnessed wage discrimination and the difficulties that come with challenging gender stereotypes in STEM. We've made progress since then and we've seen brilliant pioneering women at the forefront of every bit of technology at the very peak of science, technology, engineering, and math. And I'm incredibly proud of what the new generation of women in tech is accomplishing. But despite that progress, women still hold less than one quarter of the jobs in STEM fields while making up nearly half the US workforce. This STEM gender disparity deprives our country of talented minds that could invent the next breakthrough technology, found the next big startup, or keep our nation safe from cyber attacks. That's why I introduced the Building Blocks of STEM Act, bipartisan legislation to help close the STEM gender gap and ensure that all of our children are prepared with the education needed to succeed in a 21st century economy. This legislation supported by CEE was signed into law and will make a world of difference for all our students. I'm committed to supporting programs like CEE in Congress because I believe that access to quality education is key to building a sustainable economy, improving our communities. Investing in STEM leads to new innovations and discoveries and to finding solutions for our country's biggest challenges. Thank you again for investing in our future generations of scientists, engineers, coders, and leaders. Know that you have a partner here on Capitol Hill. Thank you. Susan, I am so excited that yesterday we received affirmation from U.S. Senator Todd Young from Indiana 
that he will be an honorary board member of CEE's Board of Trustees. As most of you know, since the inception of the Center for Excellence in Education, we have had two members of the Democratic Party, two of the Republican Party, one House and one Senate member from each party. Senator Nunn is a perfect addition to join Jackie Rosen, Senator Jackie Rosen of Nevada on our board and Congressman Neil Dunn and Congressman Peters. A bit about Senator Todd Young. He graduated from high school in Indiana and then attended and graduated from the United States Naval Academy. He accepted a commission in the U.S. Marine Corps and then went on to lead a recruiting effort in Chicago. During that time, he put himself through school at University of Chicago, where he earned his MBA in economics. Then when he was uh, retired from the military as a captain, he spent a year in London and earned an MA at the School of Advanced Study in London. Returning to the US, he met his future wife, Jenny, and studied and received his JD uh, from Indiana University. Senator Young has a son and three daughters his, his uh, priorities in the Senate are that the U.S. Senate Committee on Finance, Foreign Relations, Commerce, Science, and Transportation, Small Business and Entrepreneurship. In the House, he served on the Armed Service Committee, the House Budget Committee, and the House Ways and Means Committee. We are very happy, gratified, and honored to have Senator Todd Young join us as an honorary member of CEE's Board of Trustees. I'd like to thank at this time our trustees and all those donors and friends many of whom are listening in and participating in this Zoom session. We couldn't do our programs without the help of each of you. We depend on so much participation of friends across this country and abroad to help us achieve our mission. And it is with the help of our former Senator Joe Lieberman, who will speak today, who helped us and was an honorary board member for 17 years, that we began our relationship with DOD and they helped us with funding. And now we have a robust relationship with several agencies with the help initially from Senator Joseph Lieberman. We should go ahead and show some of the excitement of our alumni. I was going to end the program by talking about the uniqueness and creativity of our alums. Many of the public believe that to be excellent in academics, you're a nerd, that you're focused and not able in other areas. You know, there is that nexus, that relationship between piano, cello, and violin with math. But there is among our alumni of our programs a unique and creative side. Alumni involved in so many exciting hobbies and other activities. 
And I thought it would be good for you to see that although we nurture careers in STEM, we nurture the fulfillment of the students' dreams in activities and hobbies and the camaraderie between and among the alumni to enjoy each other's time. So with that, um, I'd like to show you at random, we have, there are so many hobbies and activities, but the uniqueness in creativity is born well by showing some of those activities to the members of this Zoom session. Can we show that at this time while we're waiting for Congressman Dunn? In this time of uh, trial and tribulations in the world, we know that the challenges in health, energy, defense, agriculture, ener uh, it, all the challenges are multi-dimensional. And wow, it takes an ability to cross discipline and our alums show how important it is and what can be achieved. Their academic achievements are known throughout the world from heading departments of science at leading universities at 
a number of employees doing great things at our in our corporate uh, world. So I thought it would be fun for you to see just what alums in STEM are doing besides the academic achievements. Susan, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Mrs. D. Our next honorary board member is Congressman Neil Dunn. Dr. Dunn grew up in an army family and was stationed at over 20 places before college, including in Vietnam during middle school. He was an Eagle Scout and National Merit Scholar before matriculating at Washington and Lee University. After medical school at George Washington, he joined the U.S. Army as a surgeon, completing his residency at Walter Reed Army Medical Center and surgical fellowship at Duke University. Dr. Dunn was a surgeon in Panama City, Florida for 25 years and was the founding president of the Advanced Urology Institute a 45 physician practice with over 400 employees. He also founded the Bay Regional Cancer Center and pursued a special interest in advanced prostate cancer. Prior to being elected to Congress, Dr. Dunn served on the Board of Governors of the Florida Medical Association, among many other leadership positions in the medical community. He was recognized as a healthcare hero by the Florida Department of Health, for his chairmanship of Bay Cares, a medical charity that provided about 30 million of free medical care to the local working poor. Dr. Dunn was named to the board of directors of Space Florida, which operates the space launch complexes and numerous research assembly and support facilities on Cape Canaveral. He lives in Panama City, Florida with his wife, Leah. They are the proud parents of three sons and three grandchildren. I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Dunn. Take it away. Thank you so much, Susan. I appreciate that. It's a it's a real honor to be part of today's event, uh, and and an honor to be on your board as an honorary member for the Center uh, for Excellence in Education. You know, as a, as a doctor, STEM holds a special place in my heart. Uh, uh, CEE has done a tremendous job in amplifying the nation's strong need for STEM. Uh, STEM teachers are future generations how to solve problems, make sense of information, do critical analysis, and how to gather and evaluate evidence to make intelligent decisions. And this is critical when we're faced with issues that heavily impact not only the nation, but the entire world. I'm actually coming to you from Houston, where we're meeting on energy, which is a really critical subject. And uh, we're uh, discussing uh, how that impact, how it's impacted by our national security and, and what we need to do to protect that. With our current COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen a, a higher demand for STEM, a new appreciation for uh, medical science and research. Uh, we need scientists, we need healthcare professionals, but we also need members of the public to understand the science and the analysis and not be led around uh, by uh, purported experts. Uh, we need more critical thinkers in every arena that can help us adapt our lifestyles uh, and change during uncertain times. Uh, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, occupations in STEM fields are going to grow by 10 million jobs in the next uh, eight years. It's important that we meet that demand. Last year, I uh, had a bill signed into law by President Trump that instructed the uh, National Science Foundation to develop a veterans outreach plan to connect them with uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, jobs, uh, and, and educational opportunities. They already have a head start, a lot of, a lot of a head start with their military education. H.R. Uh, 425, the Supporting Veterans and STEM Careers Act, uh, ensures the skills our veterans attain during their service to our nation are put to good use for decades to come as they successfully transition back into civilian life, much as I did, frankly. Uh, this year, I'm honored to be part of the House Energy and Commerce Committee, the oldest standing legislative committee in the House, and our committee has responsibility for matters including telecommunications, consumer protection, food and drug safety, public health, research, environmental quality, energy policy, and domestic and foreign commerce, among other things. So it, uh, it's a real chance to use some of the STEM education that I got along the way. All of these industries that I just mentioned depend heavily on uh, creative minds, analytical thinking, and STEM educations. Uh, I wanna thank you for your dedication 
to investing in future generations. And I, uh, our role in encouraging young minds to choose STEM is more important than ever. And I, I tell everyone, all the students I talk to, STEM is fun. <laughs> and it has been for me. Thanks so much, Susan. I, I yield back. Thank you, Congressman Dunn. Congressman Dunn, if you have just a few moments, sure. um, uh, could you tell us how you became interested um, as a young student in STEM and then eventually how that led um, into your career path as a doctor? So that's a fun story. I actually was telling that over dinner last night. We were as I said, with an energy crowd and uh, we were talking about how we all got interested in our various uh, areas and, and a lot of them or baby boobers like me. And uh, so we remember when the space race was on, Sputnik, uh, you know, came up, the Russians all of a sudden had the lead in space. And uh, President Kennedy, you know, told the country that we were going to put a man on the moon in 10 years, and we were going to become the preeminent space researchers. And, and uh, if you were in school at that age, I was uh, very much a uh, uh, paying attention to that. My, my father was an army officer and, uh, and we really, we all wanted to be astronauts and scientists uh, uh, growing up. And um, so it was a lifelong love affair with science and, uh, and math and engineering. We, uh, uh, so it, it was a real natural thing for me. And it's been an ongoing source of pleasure uh, to, to study all kinds of science and engineering uh, throughout my life. Uh, now I'm studying a little bit less biology and a little bit more engineering, but uh, it's it's all overlaps and they, you know the critical thinking skills lateral from one subject uh, to another. So it's a uh, it's fascinating. You know, that, that I've always enjoyed it. And and in terms of your interest in basic science, how did that translate into medicine then? Uh, so I was actually in high school and I uh, really liked biology. My biology teacher in high school said, you know, if you, if you really like biology, there's a way to make a living doing this. And you can be a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to be a biology teacher. He thought, no, he's going to be a doctor. And uh, that, that is a real great chance, honestly, to, uh, to spread your wings and try a lot of things because medicine gets involved in uh, not just biology, but also physics. You think nuclear uh, medicine. Uh, we do a lot of radiology and uh, then the ophthalmologists, they're just all about math and physics. Uh, you know, they, they're much more uh, involved with math than they are in biology. So uh, there's a lot of fields of medicine that get uh, the touch on the different uh, uh, other STEM fields. Uh, late in my career, I became a robotic surgeon. So I had to learn about robots and, and, uh, and all the sensors involved with that. So it, 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 it gets technical quickly. Understood. Um, I don't know if you were able to watch, but we showed all of the various interests that RSI alumni have outside of science. Um, and I think that for some of the younger um, scientists who are on this uh, webinar today, um, I think it's important to know that careers take a very long and winding trajectory to get yeah, to where you are. <laughs> and, um, and so my next question, I'm sure you can imagine is, how do you get from medicine uh, to politics? Oh, God. Oh, well, that's, I might have wandered a little bit farther off the center line. There. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was tricked into this job. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't regret it uh, because I get a chance to meet fascinating people, you know, and so many of them are truly heroic and, and serve the community in ways that just take your breath away. Uh, I, I, you know, been to multiple uh, Medal of Honor ceremonies. Uh, uh, I, uh, you know, so you, you really do meet some wonderful, wonderful people. I broke from a meeting to come here and join this one with, it was all oil and gas uh, engineers. And they're a bright bunch of people. And they had a lot uh, to share uh, about technology and politics and how politics affects them and their decision-making and, and uh, can destabilize energy markets, for instance. Uh, so, um, it, it, you know, it's a great group of people to learn from. You know, they're more engineers than doctors, and I'm more doctor than engineer. But um, uh, the, the things that they had to teach that overlap with politics are, are fascinating and important and important. 
That's not me, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> um, one final question for you, Congressman Dunn. Sure. Um, uh, what are your greatest concerns today about encouraging young people to get into STEM um, and to think about helping this country uh, through the work that they do? So I think it, the critical thinking skills, critical analysis, you know, it, it, there's way too many uh, people who get their information and education from sound bites. We, we've got to get around that. You know, we, we, I would like to see is, you know, every, a lot of people talking about science, you know, and said we follow the science. They're not really following the science. They're following the sound bites. And, and we've got to be able to stratify the difference between sound bites and science. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I think I've seen a certain amount of corruption in the scientific literature. So just because something's published in the Lancet or whatever doesn't mean it's true. It means you can think about it and, and take a look at their data and, and see if it's reproducible. Because that's the baseline of science. It's not, it's not, uh, it's not a, a one-time competition. It's, you know, uh, I'll tell you one story that shows this. Albert Einstein, father of general relativity theory, among others, uh, when he was, he, after the war, he, he'd come to uh, Princeton. He was a professor at Princeton. And uh, he received a letter signed by 47 uh, physics, physicists who were chairman of their departments of physics at various universities across America, saying that the theory of general relativity was impossible. It could not be true. And we, the underside 47 professors of physics, uh, so say. And uh, his response was, if they're right, why does it take 47 of them? One would have been enough. <laughs> thank you, Congressman Dunn. Um, thank you for taking time away from your busy schedule to join us. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I love this uh, group. I, I think this is, you do, you're doing the God's work here. Keep it up. Thanks so much. Take care. Now, mute and watch. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, we would like to bring back uh, uh, online um, Bryce Wong. Um, I know that uh, we are speaking about science today, but um, I'm sure many of you saw Bryce when he uh, won on Jeopardy, uh, I believe it was this week or last week. Um, and I think that uh, some of our... Uh, hi, Bryce. Hi. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, your journey to um, being on the Jeopardy competition and your strategies and, um, you know, uh, your aggressive betting strategies um, and just what you thought of the experience? Yeah. Um, so in terms of getting on to Jeopardy, um, there's like a couple of online tests and then you kind of show up in person and there's some more tests and interviews and things like that. Then they kind of just tell you, they put you in a big pool of people and they're like, we'll call you someday. And I was lucky <laughs> enough to get that call. Um, let's see. Um, in terms of the experience there, it's kind of surreal. The, the uh, stage is a lot larger than uh, I imagine. Um, there's also a lot of just interesting behind the scenes things, um, mm -hmm. sort of during all the commercial breaks, they're refilming parts where they're having the hosts um, kind of, you know, uh, provide fun facts and things like that. Um, so that was, that was a really good experience. And then in terms of the betting strategy, I guess I was inspired um, a little bit by watching James Holzhauer. Of course, nowhere near that level, but um, there was a guy on Jeopardy a couple of years ago who had a much more aggressive betting strategy and it kind of worked out for him. So kind of tried to learn from that, to place more aggressive bets and hope that um, I knew about the kind of minutia that would come up within those clues. Bryce, how do you prepare for Jeopardy? Um, have you been a member of like quiz bowl and trivia bowl teams all throughout school or how, how do you really get into this? Yeah, um, I guess it was actually through, again, the biology Olympiad that I was exposed to other people that did this thing called quiz bowl. Um, that was my first time hearing about it. And it kind of just sparked my interest in just learning about a lot of different fields um and that's initially how i got into the world of jeopardy after that um i also just tried to watch a lot of previous programs um and then just do a little bit of reading about the some other students that were doing that and that exposed me to just a whole variety of fields from literature history things like that um that i hadn't really read about before um and that sort of uh, sparked my interest in a lot of the things that do show up on jeopardy um, since that time, I guess I did watch a couple, quite a few programs and then 
um, uh, I guess, like tried, there's a database of previous questions. So I tried to pull from that and prepare that way. Does Jeopardy repeat questions or is there like a cram book or how, you know, how do you go about the actual process of preparation? Uh, I wish there were some, a cram book and they don't really repeat questions, um, <laughs> but they do have like general things that come up. For example, um, uh, it's like supposedly like classic works of literature or like uh, details of American history or presidents or, you know, sometimes it's just like, uh, I, I watched a lot of YouTube, honestly, to help prepare. Oh, is that uh, right? Lots of, you know, for example, like dog breeds and things like that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm sure this is top of mind for a lot of people with respect to Jeopardy. Um, with the passing of Alex Trebek, we are, you know, I, maybe halfway through um, the experience of auditioning new hosts for the show. Uh, what is your thought in terms of... Uh, who might be a, a good future host for the show? Like Bryce, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I think Aaron Rodgers, who's on right now, is actually, he's uh, really gunning for the job. But I personally hope uh, someone like Ken Jennings um, might, might take the host mantle. I mean, it's interesting, right, because uh, Aaron Rodgers seems to be having quite a bit of success on the show, but his background is so, um, you know, so far afield from trivia. But it's not, it looks as though he is appearing to connect well with the crowd. Yeah, definitely. I think part of it is just, um, as with anything in life, I think if you're really passionate about something, then I think it'll, it'll come across. Um, and I think it'll help um, succeed in, someone succeed in a role. Uh, Bryce, before we started the program today, you and I were having a conversation about your uh, medical studies and uh, your interests. Can you tell us a little bit more about... Um, why and how you're actually thinking about pediatric uh, ophthalmology? For ophthalmology specifically, I just think it's such an interesting field that you, you focus on, on a relatively small organ, but there's a lot of interesting um, technology there. Um, there's uh, like interesting microsurgery that happens, uh, especially some of the, the retinal work. So that's how I first got into that field. Um, and then in terms of the pediatric component, I've just really enjoyed uh, working with kids, both on my pediatrics rotation and I did a pediatric surgery rotation. So I think that that's how I got interested in that field. And so tell us about um, the pathway of your training now and how you foresee it going forward. Is there a research component or um, how, how are you moving forward with respect to your studies? Uh, so there is um, some research that I'm doing, I'm sure uh, for all the uh, physicians in the crowd here, uh, part of our application process is that we have to, um, you know, do some research. Um, and I guess in particular right now, I'm interested in sort of the cost of procedures, um, sort of more on like the insurance database side kind of work. Um, but hopefully in the future, um, I'll take a more basic science uh, approach as well to so taking a big step back, because, you know, we just had a um, conversation with Congressman Dunn, who had a, a esteemed career in medicine before moving on to Congress. If you could do anything, perhaps after your medical career, have you thought about what that might be? Um, Bryce, Bryce, don't do Congress. Don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I suppose anything but um, going into Congress. No, uh, no that's fantastic work that um, that um, all of our representatives have been doing for us. But um, for me, I guess um, I'm somewhat interested in like healthcare administration side things. Um, so perhaps not not super exciting, but perhaps that'd be something else I'd like to explore. What year are you, Bryce? Uh, I'm a third year currently. Okay, great. Where in school? At Stanford? Uh, I've heard of that place. <laughs> oh, you know, I don't know. It, it's not on the East Coast. It's not a real medical school. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm very, I'm, like, I'm super impressed. Uh, you know, it's great to have the doctors out and actually get recognition for being bright again. You know, you guys are so, so much smarter now coming out of med school than we were. We were, we were still, you know, I came out in the 70s and a lot of what we knew just wasn't true. Uh, but uh, that's the great thing about science. It changes the truth. Well, uh, 
Bryce, thank you again for coming on. I know that uh, I know people were so uh, happy to cheer for you and your success on Jeopardy. And um, we look forward to watching you in your medical career. Thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, I believe Senator Lieberman will be coming on in just a couple minutes to present the Excellence Awards. I'd like to introduce Senator Joe Lieberman. I'm sure most of you are familiar with his esteemed career in public service, but as a quick refresher, Senator Lieberman served for 24 years as a U.S. Senator from Connecticut, retiring in January 2013 following the end of his fourth term. He was the Democratic vice presidential nominee in 2000 and served as the Attorney General of the state of Connecticut from 1983 to 1989. He also served 10 years in the Connecticut State Senate, including three terms as Majority Leader. Senator Lieberman is currently a senior advisor to the law firm Kasowitz Benson Torres, advising clients on a wide range of public policy, strategic and regulatory issues. During his tenure in the Senate, Lieberman helped shape legislation in virtually every major area of public policy and served in many leadership roles, including chairman of the Committee on Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs. Senator Lieberman led numerous congressional investigations, including investigations into Enron's collapse, the federal government's response to Hurricane Katrina, the Fort Hood mass shooting, and most recently, the deadly attack in Benghazi, Libya. Senator Lieberman is the recipient of numerous awards and recognitions. In 2015, he received the Winston Churchill National Leadership Award, which recognizes an individual whose career has exhibited the virtues of resolution, magnanimity, and goodwill in the service of constitutional democracy, exemplified by the life and career of Winston Churchill. In addition to practicing law, Senator Lieberman is Honorary National Founding Chair of No Labels, an American political organization composed of Republicans, Democrats, and independents, whose mission is to usher in a new era of focused problem solving in American politics. Since 2014, Senator Lieberman and former Homeland Security Secretary Tom Ridge have co-chaired the Bipartisan Committee on Biodefense, which has provided recommendations to improve the U.S. Senate, the United States efforts in the biodefense area, particularly as it relates to biosecurity and pandemic preparedness. Senator Lieberman is also on the Board of Trustees for the McCain Institute for International Leadership, the Board of Trustees for the Institute for the Study of War, and the Board of Directors of the Center for a New American Security. Senator Lieberman served on the Center's Board of Trustees for 17 years, and we are so grateful for his longstanding support. Without further ado, Senator Lieberman. Well, uh, having just successfully unmuted myself, which is <laughs> power that uh, I appreciate having. Uh, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. I'm really delighted to be able to participate this year virtually in this uh, annual congressional luncheon of the Center for Excellence in Education. Um, my involvement in this center began in the mid-90s when my uh, former colleague, Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, who I respected greatly and was something of a mentor to me, was leaving the Senate. And one of the things he asked me to do was to take up the torch, as it were, of the uh, Center for Excellence in Education, CEE. And uh, I hadn't known much about it at that time, uh, but I learned uh, uh, from Sam and then from Joanne De Gennaro uh, what it was. And it was created, as you all know, by Admiral Hyman Rickover, who had been a hero to me uh, growing up uh, because of the role, patriotic role he had played in building America's nuclear Navy. The, um, the, an uh, application of science in a rigorous, demanding way, in that case, to meet the defense needs of our country. And of course, what Admiral Rickover started, which is our nuclear Navy, has only grown in importance to our uh, security and strategic defense since then, right up until this day. But the Center for Excellence 
in education was a vision that Admiral Rickover and his um, co-worker, really, Joanne De Gennaro, had to take um, th this principle of uh, stimulating, recognizing, and rewarding excellence in uh, STEM, uh, scientific, technological, engineering, and mathematics education uh, for the greater good of our society, not just defense. And uh, the CE has done this remarkably. I became uh, not just, I did it really because Sam asked me to do it. I did it because I revered the memory of Admiral Rickover. Uh, but as time went on, I, I continued to be uh, faithful and as supportive as I could possibly be of CEE because of the, uh, what, the great work it was doing. Uh, CEE is a uh, excuse. <laughs> You know, this happens every now and then. It's a, call, <laughs> it's a call from my wife who's in the other room. I would say it was a mistake. Okay, oh, it's my wife's phone. Oh my God. Okay, sweetie, <laughs> I'm on. Oh, Thank sorry, you, that was sorry, beautiful. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right, you can see this is for real and not just. <laughs> the pleasures of Zoom. Yeah, right. So uh, uh, the CE has continued to deliver on this promise and really in, in stimulating the highest quality uh, science and technological education and rewarding those and incentivizing those who achieve, uh, it has produced now a series of graduates that have gone on to do remarkable work. I, I must say that when I left the Senate uh, during my time in the Senate, the decision by uh, Joanne, Mel, and others uh, in CEE to create this award in my name touched me greatly. And I, I can't think of a, of a greater honor and frankly, a greater legacy, um, much better than having a road or a bridge or even a book <laughs> named after me. This is alive and productive. And uh, the recipients of this uh, Lieberman Award prove how um, important CEE is and how CEE is a kind of um, a message to society of what we should be doing more broadly, which is to stimulate first-class education for our children, uh, motivate our children, uh, reward them when they do well, uh, and that will benefit our society uh, on into the future. Uh, it's too simple to relate everything to our increasing competition, hopefully peacefully, with China in the years ahead. But part of it uh, depends on maintaining a, uh, a strong defense, but part of it depends on just competing more effectively, uh, particularly in, in STEM areas. And uh, <laughs> to a certain extent, uh, CEE is the little engine that could and has <laughs> And uh, uh, anyway, I'm really uh, uh, grateful for this um, award in my name and, and, and really honored to be able to be here to present these awards today to these two remarkable graduates of uh, CEE's Research Science Institute. First is Mark uh, Kantrowitz. Uh, he's a nationally re recognized expert on student financial aid, scholarships, college saving plans, and student loans. So this, this suggests the range of where uh, the graduates of our programs go. His mission has been to deliver practical information, advice and tools to students and their families for them to make informed decisions about planning and paying for college. What could be more important as the follow on to what I've just described as the excellence in education. He earned a Bachelor of Science degree, actually degrees in mathematics and philosophy. This suggests that he was not any ordinary science student and a master uh, from MIT and a master of science degree in computer science from Carnegie Mellon, Mellon University. Warren Williams uh, is a, an alumnus also of the Research Science Institute and Dwight Parker is, she, she is the Dwight Parker Robinson Professor of Mathematics at Harvard and the Sally Sterling Siever Professor at the Radcliffe Institute 
And just think about it. So the, as, as students, uh, uh, they went through the CEA programs and look at where they are now. She's known for her work in algebraic uh, combinations, com, combina, yes, combinatorics. Go help me with that pronunciation. In particular, in total positivity, cluster algebras, and tropical geometry. She earned an AB in mathematics from Harvard, her PhD uh, at MIT, and her dissertation was titled Combinational Aspects of Total Positivity. I know she meant that, uh, and, and uh, it was focused on the scientific aspect, but I would say that uh, we need more positivity uh, <laughs> in society generally today. So uh, Mark Kantrowitz, Lauren Williams, I can't tell you how proud I am to present you with the Senator Joseph Haberman Award for 2021. Congratulations. Thank you, Senator Lieberman. Um, I believe Lauren is on um, and will provide a few remarks. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren. Hi, thank you so much. This is the, <laughs> this is the award that I've just received. So thank you so much, Senator Lieberman. Thank you, Mrs. D. Thank you to the CEE and to the members of Congress and the alumni of the CEE programs and everyone who's here. Um, I'm incredibly honored to receive this award and uh, really happy to be with you all virtually at this uh, congre congressional luncheon. So my own connection to the Center for Excellence in Education is that I attended the CEE's Research Science Institute in 1994 when I was in high school. So several previous speakers have, have mentioned the Research Science Institute, um, but for those of you who are less familiar with it, uh, the Research Science Institute, or just RSI, is an intensive science research program for talented high school students, which is held at MIT each summer. Well, not during the pandemic, obviously. Um, so the program consists of about 50 students from the United States and 30 from abroad. It's totally free for participants and it places students in research labs in the Boston area. So the six week program is basically a crash course in the life of a scientific researcher. Um, and the RSI has had an incredible influence on the lives of its alumni. Um, many of the RSI alumni have gone on to become leading scientists in academia and industry as well as entrepreneurs. So looking back um, on my own time there, uh, I can say my own experience at RSI in the summer of 94, when I was a high school student, was life-changing. I was only 16, and I knew nothing about math research at the time. But at RSI, I spent six weeks working intensively on a research project in combinatorics and meeting, meeting daily with mathematician Satomi Okazaki. Oh, I know how to pronounce that word. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's tricky. It? You learn something new every day. <laughs> ah, particularly at CEE. What does it mean? Combinatorics is roughly about the study of discrete structures. An example would be counting a family of objects. So all kinds of counting problems fall under the umbrella of combinatorics. Okay, that's helpful. Now, you know, when I was at Yale, they had a special track for people like me to satisfy our science requirement. It was called Science for Non-Science Majors. <laughs> and so you've, you've done a good job at, at uh, explaining that in a way that I could understand. Thanks. I'm sorry. Oh, good, good. Thank you. <laughs> so at the time, I knew nothing about combinatorics, but I started meeting daily with my mentor, um, mathematician Satomi Okazaki, who was then a graduate student of Richard Stanley, um, a renowned professor at MIT. So in those six weeks, I was exposed to graduate level combinatorics, I learned how to read a research paper. I learned how to program in C and Maple. I learned how to write a technical paper. I learned how to give a scientific presentation. And of course, when I say learned, I don't mean I mastered any of these skills, but what I experienced was a kind of deep dive into the life of a research mathematician. And in particular, i would never realized how much creativity goes into math research. Uh, so I was able to read a research paper by a well-known mathematician, Doron Zeilberger, and eventually make progress beyond what he had done. And this experience was in intoxicating. Um, it was my experience at RSI that summer that gave me the idea that I would like to eventually get a PhD in math and become a professor. Now, 
While the program was amazing as an academic experience, it was exhilarating as a social experience. Exhilarating to meet this cohort of teenagers from all over the United States and even around the world who were so talented, so driven to change the world and so very curious about science. So we stayed up late, we spent our weekends debating the meaning of life, writing poetry, exploring the steam tunnels of MIT, traipsing around Boston, and um, putting these kinds of creative, intense kids together inevitably leads to a certain amount of mischief. <laughs> so I remember one memorable afternoon early on in the program when all 80 of us were taken to a local McDonald's, very big one, and given the following instructions. You have three hours to perform any scientific experiment you like using only materials you can find in McDonald's. Afterwards, you will write a technical report about your findings. So as you can imagine, unleashing 80 teenage mad scientists at McDonald's may have tested the tolerance of the customers and employees there. <laughs> now, I don't remember all of the experiments, but there was a memorable one regarding the adhesion of Big Mac patties to walls. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in spite of, or perhaps because of, our various antics, we students had an unforgettable summer and made lifelong friends. So our site, of course, was only six weeks during the summer of my 16th year, but the influence of RSI has, has lasted my lifetime so far. Um, so after the program ended, the network that RSI introduced me to continued to guide my research as a high school student. I lived in the Los Angeles area, so my RSI mentor Satomi connected to me to a mathematician at UCLA Doug Youngreis, with whom I subsequently met every month or so. Um, my research did well in science fairs and was published in a journal while I was still in high school. And once I was in college, I had a chance to meet Doron Seilberger, the mathematician whose work I had generalized during RSI. And I wrote my senior thesis with Richard Stanley, who was the PhD advisor of my RSI mentor. Um, I eventually went to MIT for math graduate school, and I worked with Richard Stanley. Um, I'm now a math professor whose research area is combinatorics, precisely the subject that I did at, at RSI. Um, so it's quite clear to me that my early exposure to combinatorics and math research at RSI while I was in high school had a huge, huge impact on the trajectory of my career. And um, moreover, I'm still close friends with some of the people I got to know at RSI. So for example, one of my friends from RSI was Jenny Hoffman, who's now a physics professor and my colleague at Harvard. We have a standing weekly meeting to discuss our research, our teaching, our students, and also to brainstorm about to, how to increase the support for and representation of women and minorities in STEM. So um, I'll end by saying that now that I'm a parent of two young children, I'm doubly appreciative for the unique role that the Center for Excellence plays for scientifically talented youth. I can see that so much of our education system here in the US is focused on making sure that every student achieves a certain minimal literacy in humanities and sciences. And of course, this is a very, very important and necessary goal. But what CEE particularly excels at is capturing the imaginations of future leaders in STEM fields. So thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Lauren, thank you and congratulations. I'm telling you, uh, we could not have asked for a, a better statement that brought alive what uh, CEE's RSI means and meant to you uh, uh, in the career that you uh, followed, career path you followed, which has been so extraordinarily uh, constructive. Uh, it was just a beautiful statement. And it was funny at times, too. <laughs> so, anyway, I'm, I'm very proud to have worn, and I, uh, I look forward to uh, following your career now. And uh, I think now I'm ready to go back to college, probably <laughs> not Harvard, but then take the real science courses <laughs> instead of... <laughs> anyway... All the best to you. Congratulations. And to Mark Hamptowitz as well. Thank, thank you so much, Senator Lieberman. Congratulations, Lauren. Mark, are you there? So, 
this is the award, and I can't understate how heavy it is. Um, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if uh, you remember, but I actually testified before one of your committees, the Senate Government Affairs Committee, 20 years ago. Uh, it had to do with college scholarships. You um, know, when I saw your name and I saw your picture, I said, I know that man from somewhere. It wasn't, as the old joke goes, from the uh, poster of the 10 Most Wanted at the post office. But, I, but that's it. And it's great to see you again. I'm very proud that you are a recipient of an award in my name and really uh, impressed by all you have done in the years, not only since then, but since the RSI. So it's all yours, congratulations. Thank you. So I, I'd like to thank the Senator, uh, Joanne De Janeiro and CEE for this great honor. When I attended the first year of RSI in 1984, Admiral Rickover was still actively involved. He was involved for the first two and a half years and he made a, a really deep impression on me. His interest in improving education and his focus on excellence and his strong work ethic were a key influence on me and the path I've taken with my life. He pushed me to the limits of my abilities and then a little bit further. And I think that's one of the key characters of uh, RSI is that uh, the synergy that develops when you put bright, students together and they, they force each other to go above and beyond. My, my training is as a research scientist, but I see my mission as helping students pursue a college education by providing them, their families, and policymakers with the insights and tools they need to make smarter, more informed decisions. This work began with RSI in a way. I began when Mrs. D, Mrs. D. Gennaro, uh, and I co-authored a book about scholarships and fellowships for math and science students. That book came out in 1993. And this led to the development of the first website about college financial aid, the FinAid website, and the first of more than 150 student aid policy analysis papers. The FinAid site was one of the first 100 commercial websites. Uh, I also created a free scholarship matching service helped design the online FAFSA form in 1986, uh, did some work that led to the development of income-driven repayment plans and net price calculators. And this work has benefited millions of students nationwide. And I hope that it makes it easier for them to pursue a college education. Throughout my career, I have tried to act as a catalyst for improvements in college access, college affordability, and college success. I will continue to work to remove barriers to college enrollment and completion. Thank you again for this uh, wonderful award. Uh, Mark, thank you and congratulations. Thanks uh, for uh, reminding us uh, in a personal way about how important CEE's RSA uh, experience was to you and of, of, of the model that Admiral Rickover set. I, I just can't uh, resist saying that during this last terrible year of the pandemic, uh, we have seen again the extent to which uh, excellence in science and STEM uh, can uh, save us from our, our worst problems. And I'm speaking obviously about the combined public-private support for excellence, innovation, brilliance that has produced the vaccines uh, that and other uh, um, responses that are are now giving us hope that uh, that the pandemic is uh, receding. So uh, you you have uh, excelled in a, a you might say a non traditional scientific field, but in doing so, you've opened the doors of opportunity and continued education for countless. Uh, American students, uh, countless students, and uh, in that sense have really contributed enormously through each of them to the betterment of our society. So uh, I'm, I'm very proud to have presented you with this award. Glad you survived your testimony before my Senate committee <laughs> and gone on the great things, and I'm sure you will continue uh, to live a life of excellence and uh, accomplishment uh, in the years ahead. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.
Um, I'd like to note that, uh, that Mark uh, has been a longstanding trustee of the center um, and has put in countless hours behind the scenes in assisting the center, um, especially with uh, our current project to update the website. Um, thank you, Mark, um, and I am proud to call you a dear friend. Uh, Senator Lieberman, I hope next year we'll be doing this in person. <laughs> me too, me too, but this was fun and a, a cameo from my wife, you know, was unusual, but I hope I Maybe it. she'll be able to come with you next year. <laughs> I think she'll, she'll uh, be uh, required to come with me. <laughs> Wonderful. All Thank right, you all. Thank you, Lauren, Mark. Congratulations to all. Thank you. Be well. To conclude our program, I'm delighted to introduce Delegate Mark Keem, who represents the 35th District in the Virginia House of Delegates. In 2009, he became the first Asian-born immigrant and the first Korean-American elected to any state-level office in Virginia. A recognized leader on technology and innovation issues in the General Assembly, Delegate Keem serves on the House Commerce and Labor, Finance, Education and Agriculture, Chesapeake and Natural Resources Committees. Over the past decade, he has authored dozens of state laws that impact quality of life for Virginians. Delegate Keem maintains a reputation as an effective bipartisan policymaker and has received awards and recognition from a wide spectrum of organizations. Professionally, he has three decades of experience in both the private and public sectors and is a member of the bar in two states. Delegate Kim was born in Korea and lived in Vietnam and Australia before moving to America as a teenager. He received a political science degree from the University of California at Irvine and a law degree from UC Hastings College of Law. He and his wife, Alex, reside in Vienna and have two children in public schools. Delegate Kim. Yeah, thank you very much, Susan. I appreciate Welcome. it. And uh, thank you for giving me a few minutes. Uh, it's good to see well a couple of you on face, and I know many of you are online as well. I also want to thank uh, Joanne uh, DeGenero and all of the staff at CE for all that you've done and you continue to do. And for those who made today's uh, program possible, especially the logistics folks, uh, Kyle and others, thank you for what you're doing behind the scenes. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you. And I'm sorry that we all can't be together in a ballroom somewhere, but I hopefully next year, uh, thanks to the miracle of science, we'll all be together very soon. I also wanna congratulate uh, both Lauren and uh, Mark for their awards. And not only are, are the work that you've done and accomplishments are much deserving of the award and the recognition, but the fact that it came from uh, former Senator Joe Lieberman, off, I think, is a very special touch as well. I, I'm sorry that I had a chance to listen to the senator a little bit. Uh, he and I overlapped a little bit ourselves. I was on Capitol Hill from 2001 till 2007 when he was uh, chairman of the Government Affairs Committee. And I, my, my boss at the time, Senator Durbin, who was also a member of that committee, we had a chance to work on the Homeland Security um, Department. I, we actually wrote the bill that uh, stood that uh, department up, as well as a number of other work that we've done. And on a personal note, I used to have a townhome in Alexandria. I now live in Vienna, but we ended up selling our Alexandria townhome to his uh, chief of staff at the time. And so we had this small connection between uh, the two of us. But anyway, it's great to see that the senator is active here. I know uh, other senators I know, uh, from uh, Nevada and other places and our congressman was also participating. So it's great to continue the conversation among those who are policymakers at the federal and myself state level, as well as all of you in the academic world and in the, the real world of things that really exciting happen in the science labs and such. And of course, our, our leaders in the business community as well as the nonprofits. So I'm glad that we're all able to come together. And the reason why we're here today is to celebrate the 37 years now going into 38 years of the Center for Excellence in Education and all the work that it's done. And it's remarkable because today, if you uh, look at the headlines or you talk to folks in the business world, or, or especially in the work that I do as the chairman of the Higher Education Subcommittee in the Virginia House of Delegates, the word STEM is almost a household word now. Everybody talks about STEM. I mean, it's STEM is like the coolest thing. You know, it's like STEM, equity is the other conversation we all talk about, and empathy and all this. But uh, the fact that everybody talks about science, technology, engineering, math, and healthcare, among other aspects of the, the STEM and the arts, it is now such a common place that nobody blinks an eye when you say, oh, I want to study STEM. But it wasn't always like that. And I remember because uh, around the time that CE was founded, I was heading to college myself. I, I entered college in the 1984. 
at a sleepy little school in uh, California called Irvine, which at that time was just a brand new campus, maybe 20 years old at most. And it wasn't really known for much. Uh, the only program that it was at that time known for was a strong biology and, and an emerging computer science program. And of course, me being a guy that flunked uh, physics and chemistry and biology and calculus and algebra, you name it, anything that had numbers or Latin words in it, I couldn't handle. And so uh, I'm not getting A's in French and journalism and, and English. And so <laughs> I was destined to be on the liberal arts side of things. I ended up going as a political science major and uh, uh, graduated a few years after that, did a program in Washington, D.C. called the UCDC internship where the California students who want to have a field uh, of uh, studies in politics and government have a chance to get uh, hands-on experience. That brought me to Washington, D.C. back in the 80s for the first time. And I really enjoyed uh, working in government and seeing the policymaking. So I decided to go back and, and get a grad degree. And then I came back to D.C. and have been here for almost 30 years now working in government public policy world. And so for me, STEM was not something that I thought about as a career path, let alone an academic uh, uh, passion for myself. And my wife, who um, I met and married here, is also a, an immigrant like me from Korea. And she also was a business major with an English minor. And so by the time we got married and we're both as uh, practicing attorneys working in government and, and the private sector, we would not have imagined the scenario that we face now, which is my son, who's uh, a freshman at Virginia Tech, is studying aeronautical engineering. I can't, <laughs> I can't even spell those words. And my daughter, who's applying for colleges as we speak, uh, is considering uh, pre-med and she wants to be a doctor. And uh, she's contemplating between UC Berkeley and uh, a couple of other campuses now looking at uh, hardcore sciences. And so my wife and I look at each other thinking, one of us must have cheated here because there's no way that two lawyers with uh, <laughs> liberal arts degrees could produce two kids that are passionate about science and technology and engineering and math and medicine. But that is the world that we're living in now. In 35 years, the time that CE has been around, you have made the idea of uh, technology and science being the cutting edge into a mainstream issue. And the work that you've done to create leaders who are no longer young people. Now they've you know, gone through your program, RSI for the last 35 years. Now you are the experts and many of you are the senior leaders in your fields. That's, that's a testament to the fact that you were there in the get-go. And of course, with uh, the Admiral uh, and, uh, and others who, and Joanne and others who, who made this possible and continue to work shows how far our country has come. And, and in particular, I'm proud as a member of the Virginia House of Delegates representing an area called Tyson's and the McLean area. I'm so proud that CE is headquartered in my district. And so this year during this special session, uh, during the session that we just ended uh, yesterday, I, unfortunately we couldn't go down to Richmond, but we did everything virtually, but I was able to pass a resolution, which uh, had this been in a physical context, I would actually have the physical uh, resolution in front of me, but it's apparently in Richmond. And I'm supposed to go pick it up sometime. <laughs> they won't mail it to us because those things are really big, uh, but I'll have to go pick it up sometime in the next few weeks and hand deliver it to your offices. But uh, let me just read just a very short uh, portion of this. This is the 2021 session House Joint Resolution number 717 offered on February 2nd, 2021. Patrons are Delegate Keem and Senator Janet Howell, who's also from the Tysons area, commending the Center for Excellence in Education. Whereas for more than 37 years, the Center for Excellence in Education located in Tysons and led by Joanne DeGenero has provided unique opportunities to outstanding high school and college students and teachers to further explore leadership in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Whereas founded in 1983 by the late Admiral H.G. Rickover and Joanne DeGenero, the Center for Excellence in Education nurtures careers of excellence and leadership in science, technology, engineering, and math for academically talented high school and college students, challenging and assisting them on a long-term basis to become creators, inventors, scientists, leaders of the first 21st century. And uh, we can read the rest of it, but I think a lot of the, the content is right there. I wanna just wrap this up by saying, the center offers all of its programs at no cost to participants, which is an amazing thing that you do. It's an amazing benefit. And whereas a significant number of students and teachers in the Commonwealth have benefited from the program, resolved that the House of Delegates and the State Senate concurring at the General Assembly of Virginia hereby commend the Center for uh, Excellence in Education for its years of service to students and teachers in the Commonwealth and be it resolved that the Clerk of the House prepare a copy of this resolution to present to uh, Miss D as well as to all the leadership. And I will do that physically the next time I get to see you all. But in the meantime, I hope you will accept uh, 
this electronic version of the resolution to honor and to congratulate all that you've done for 37 years. So congratulations and thank you for all you do. And thank you so much, Delegate Keem. It was an honor to have you go forward and to have this presentation to the center. Um, I receive the accolades, but I receive them on behalf of Mel, our chairman of the board, the trustees, the friends, the alums, everyone who makes it possible, and particularly those like yourself in the Commonwealth. Uh, thank you. Today, you have learned firsthand about the product of the center's many years of STEM programming. The center nurtures talent. It is the center's trustees, individuals, corporations, and organizations that make our efforts possible. I wanted to say, uh, backing up, Mark Kantrowitz said that the statuettes were heavy. Well, the other gift that the center will present, and it's in the mail today, is a $10,000 check, a little bit lighter than the statuette, but I'm sure in high regard, given to Lauren and Mark for their wonderful excellence. So with that, um, all of you, Senator Lieberman, Senator Rosen, Congressman Dunn, Delegate Keem, so much thanks. And Susan, you did a terrific job for us today, and I applaud your efforts. To the program directors at CEE, you are the lifeblood of our excellence. And the staff who really put in so much time to make today's event successful. Also, our new program director for RSI, an alum, Dr. Jamie Wells, who will lead the RSI, a physician herself, will take it to new heights. And she is working diligently already for its success. You know, I'll end by thinking and, and uh, repeating one of Admiral Rickover's famous one-liners that I can repeat one of his favorites is, you can't go to heaven if you die dumb. Well, I think he doesn't have to worry about any of the alums of CEE's programs. They're certainly going to lead this nation and our civilization to bigger and better things. Thank you all for being part of our program today. I hope that you got a different taste with, with learning about our alumni and the things, the excitement that they generate with so much that they do. From the dancers to the opera singers, to the ice skaters, to the glass blowers, on and on and on. Thank you all for being a part of our organization. This is the end of our program. God bless you. Thank you all for being with us.